I vividly remember the six-year-old me and my younger brother being lifted one after the other into one of about six rocket ships on a roundabout at a beachside funfair in Rill, eagerly awaiting the accelerating spinning flight through the cold night air, wafted with the odours of candy floss and onions. The rotation began, uncomfortable in its tendency to throw us from our seats. The idea was that this orbital ejector effect could be compensated by pulling on a control stick that arced the rocket higher from the ground, now flying around the roundabout, but closer to the axis of the spin, and consequently moving more slowly. Years later, as a budding physicist, I realised that the ejector force in this new orientation would be pushing us into our seats rather than flinging us out. But the young me, feeling sick from the low-level high-speed flight, ignored the cries of pull the lever that were shouted at us each time we passed our highly amused uncle for about 60 laps, each one more sickly. We never took off, and after it had stopped, it was many minutes before we could walk. Hello, Tedx. My name is Nicholas. And who is this? Three feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. Three feet, two and a half down. Break that out. Four forward. Four forward. Drift into the right a little. Three feet, down a half. Thirty second forward. Just That's from 50 years ago and a quarter of a million miles away. I'm here to talk to you about telepresence and long-range interactions. Telepresence here is defined as the subjective experience of being in one place or environment, even when one is physically situated in another. But where am I? It sounds like I could almost be on the moon, because I've had the audio team make me sound like I was part of that Apollo mission. The audio is in a fairly narrow range of frequencies, none of the low notes, and not too many of the high notes. Let's bring the audio more up to date and see if you think that brings me any closer. How's that? This is the range of frequencies used for conferencing calls. Still not quite here. How about going back to text but using a local voice to read it for us. My name is Nicholas. I am here to talk to you about telepresence and long-range interaction. Am I sounding any closer? Some of you are probably thinking maybe not. Or even that's not Nicholas, it's the Daniel voice on a Mac. So what will make you believe that I am here with you? Imagine we were leaning on a wall, side by side, looking out over this river. Do you recognize it? You wouldn't need to see me to feel that we were there together, especially if we were to share and comment on the same scene. Watch out for the rainbow. But on a train, we might be facing each other, and then it would be easy to believe we were co-located. Does this help? Perhaps now we could wave at each other. Of course, I could have pre-recorded that. So why don't you wave, and then I'll wave back. Then I could always come on stage, like in a theatre, where the actors are present in a makeshift scene. The craft of the theatre is to use vision, sound, gesture, innuendo, so that we can suspend disbelief and suppose that some superficial stage set and the actors are a new kind of reality. But it's a bit of a one-way thing because the actors know that they're acting, mostly, and we're not allowed, as objective scientists, like what I am, to, to probe that reality. We can't go away interfere with what's going on too much. So it's a little bit unfair. Nevertheless, we succumb to it, 
and we let them make us empathize, feel sadness, joy, fear. And if we were to transfer them from the stage to the big screen, then our presence in their company would be a kind of telepresence. A part of my professional interests are to take people to remote laboratories so that wherever they're located, they can go into the laboratories just with the same sense of presence that you might have in a blockbuster movie, but with the critical faculties and feelings of the fun fair ground, fun, fun fair rider. So that's what I'd like to do. But let's take stock of the situation that we've got now. I talked to you earlier on about my youthful ride at the fairground. Then we heard something from 50 years ago and a quarter of a million miles away. Crystal clear, though, as it comes through, that first lunar landing. And then through various bits of telephony, uh, I took you eventually on a video tour of the Niagara Falls. And do you remember the rainbow? So those are okay, but they are all in the past. Those presences that I'm referring to were somehow back in the past. And I want to see if we can get a little more present with our telepresence. But you know, we do it all the time. We're often present in two different places at the same time. Maybe we're just reflecting on memories, or we're daydreaming, or we're texting, or we're talking to somebody on the phone, or we're watching a film, during that, we're receiving sens sensations from different places, from, from two realities at least. And with a bit of skill, we can vary how much of each reality we take on board. So I wonder if there's something in here that we might be able to use to give us that kind of reality that I'm looking for. Because it can be dangerous. We know, and what colleagues here at the Open University have shown, that there can be some cognitive distraction caused by this kind of thing. So you have to be very careful driving without due care and attention while using a hands-free phone, for example. The telepresence is not to be taken lightly, but it can be used as a force for good. Let's first of all, though, go back to the fun fair because I did try again. As an adult, I clearly remember getting into this roller coaster ride. And there were five on the seat behind, and, and we shifted across, and there were four up front with me. And I put my hands out as I heard the door click and I grabbed onto the safety bar like this. And then, with a bit of a jolt and a clatter, we were off, and I looked up, and I could see with cartoon-like simplicity the tracks rising up before me, and we began to climb. And as we got near the top, the track fell out of my eye line, and my heart began to beat faster in anticipation of what was going to happen next. And the sound changed. We could hear the wheels adjusting and trying to find the downward track. And it got faster. And I looked up again, and I could see, to my horror, that the ravine that we were supposed to be crossing, there was a gap in the track. There should have been some kind of viaduct, and we were accelerating towards it. And suddenly, we were shot precipitously out into space. The clatter went silent. All you could hear was the cold, tearing wind, heart beating, and stomach left somewhere behind. And then a few seconds later, you could see we were lined up. We were going to land back on the track, and we hit absolutely spot on, perfect. A little bit of a shake, and we were straight off, and the journey continued. Well, it went on for a few minutes more. And although it was only an adapted flight simulator, I, and I hadn't gone anywhere, I found the whole thing absolutely exhausting. Now, how is it that those two experiences of mine at fairgrounds, the real one and the virtual reality one, are now so real to me? They both have the same amount of reality. I think it is because my senses are being truly overwhelmed with information. And now I recall, actually, in that flight simulator, they played a lot of loud music at the same time. So we were in sensory overload, and our critical faculties were suppressed. And I think by that artifice, they got away with it. So I wonder if there's anything that we can do with this idea of telepresence. Anything that we do do. Yes, we do. There's some great things come out of telepresence. Telemedicine, for example, puts a patient in touch with medical professionals 
over the internet, and one is able to diagnose the condition of the other by means of observation and uh, voice interactions. And it could even be a team of diagnosticians working together. They could be spread across the entire continent, all working on the same patient. That's quite a good thing. Here's another thing that I've come across with telepresence, and that's music tuition over the internet. Taking the pace out of peripatetics, a teacher on the internet with an instrument could be teaching a learner on the internet with another instrument. And if we work hard to keep the delay down in the transmission of signals, they could even play together. They could be several, several hundred kilometers apart and still be playing together in time. That's remarkable. Also, with telepresence, we could, uh, we could acclimatize ourselves to things. Now, actually, I don't mind spiders, but some people don't like spiders. But imagine being able to get used to a certain spiders, get up close safely in some kind of virtual environment. And I've had the old headsets on, looking around. I've been to the bottom of the ocean. I stood just a few weeks ago. I was standing on the moon. Uh, and even more recently, I was in a clinic learning how to take blood, all in a virtual reality environment. Really quite convincing. So is this where I should be going when I'm trying to take my students into the laboratory to do their hands-on discovery learning? That's the kind of question that I'm asking right now. So should we be doing that? Well, it's, <coughs> it's worth a try. And so we've done some of that, but I've been thinking a little bit more about it and, and worrying. Because here's what happens in my real laboratory with research students. I teach them not to become part of the apparatus. If something needs holding at a particular angle, get a clamp. Or if it needs moving, get an actuator to do it. Or if you need to get your head into a particular position to see something, get a camera. Or you need to listen for a hiss, or a crack, or a click, get a microphone. Or you need to put your hand inside to feel if something is too hot to touch. Get a temperature indicator, also known as thermometer. In fact, get away from the experiment. You ought to be able to get out of the room if you're a good observational experimentalist. Go to a different building. Get out of the country. So in fact, this idea of remote laboratories that I'm interested in taking our remote students to, it's more the norm than you might imagine. It shouldn't be unusual. It's a very good objective way to do science. So when we're trying to imagine what's next in the way that we take our students to laboratories, I want to be inspired a little bit by that. So much so that I think now I'm imagining that the most sensational laboratory experience that I can devise will not be based upon the senses directly of the people in the laboratory and their sensations, but it will be based upon getting instruments to provide data possibly to pre-process data, to put it in, into a cockpit array of information that comes towards you and allows you to be that stepping back, objective scientist, looking at things, <coughs> interacting with the data, thinking very carefully about it. And so I think, in summary, what I could say is that my laboratory experience is going to be, and I'm rather relieved at this, rather more audience than fairground.